So there are a lot of long-term goals of interfaith leadership and interfaith cooperation, really working towards a world that is more pluralistic. But um, in the short term, what are some of the civic goods? What are some of the benefits from people working together and getting to know each other across lines of difference? So I'm going to just share a few of these with you. These are what he defines as the five civic goods of interfaith leadership. The first one, I think, is fairly obvious, increasing understanding and reducing prejudice. So by exercising interfaith leadership, by coming together across lines of difference, we will increase our understanding of other people and be able to question some of our assumptions about other groups, reduce prejudice, and um, begin to question some of our own biases. Second, strengthening social cohesion and reducing chances for identity-based conflict. And there's actually some social science research that supports this. Um, Varshney's research based in India, I think, is particularly fascinating, where he looks at what he calls networks of engagement, which are both formal and informal lines of association between diverse communities. And he found that it, when these networks exist, they can actually prevent identity-based conflict. And he did his research in different areas of India, trying to figure out why identity-based conflict was breaking out in some areas and not in other areas, even though the demographics were similar. So actually creating networks where people can come together across lines of difference um, really has the potential for reducing identity-based conflict. Third is fostering the continuity of identity communities and reducing isolation. So as we talked about this morning, we're living at a time when identity communities across the board are losing members. And um, some social scientists, including Peter Berger and including Christian Smith, believe that an important reason for this is actually because of the challenge they face in positively engaging diversity. So because these communities have not engaged diversity positively and proactively, that's some of the reasons why they're, they're not as appealing and the, why they're losing members. So interfaith cooperation is actually a way to help these traditional communities continue to engage their members by engaging diversity in a more positive and proactive way um, and strengthen the fabric of these communities. And I think that the example given this morning about Hillel that the Jacobsons gave is a good example of this as an organization that has said, we are a Jewish organization and we're going to welcome in diversity, we're going to welcome in people from other backgrounds and that really, really resonates especially with young people today. The fourth benefit is um, creating binding narratives for diverse societies in terms of our public narrative, and the fifth one, which I'll focus on the most, is um, bridging social capital and addressing social problems. And I've used the word social capital a few times today, which is generally defined as well-organized networks of people whose energy is directed towards, civ towards civic ends. So there's a lot of social capital that exists within historic religious communities and other religious communities um, that are really strongly binded together. And um, interfaith cooperation has the opportunity to actually bridge. If there's a community here that has very strong social capital, there's another community here that has strong social capital. By building bridges between the two of them, they're able to increase their social capital and therefore able to increase their ability to solve social problems. And again, there's, there's a lot of research to back this up. Um, classic theories of intergroup relations focus on how prejudice and conflict can be overcome by giving individuals who are on opposite sides opportunities to work together problem solving on a common project. So this goes beyond people who are on opposite sides sitting together and having a conversation, but by actually saying, okay, we might disagree vehemently about abortion, but we've got an issue of hunger in our community. Let's come together and figure out how we can solve that. Um, classic theories of intergroup relations show that that is actually really effective in bringing people together. And I'll share just a personal example of how powerful I think this um, bridging social capital potential is. When I was living in New York a few years ago, I volunteered at a homeless shelter that was co-run by a church and by a synagogue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And obviously one benefit of this was that people, volunteers from both communities as well as the people that were being served got to know each other and build relationships across lines of difference. But there was also a real practical benefit here that I saw, which is that both groups were able to take advantage of each other's resources. So if one group was running a homeless shelter three days a week and another one was running a homeless shelter four days a week, they would each only be relying on their own resources, their own human resources and volunteers to staff the shelter those days of the week. So, you know, if I'm only free on Tuesdays, but my synagogue's running the shelter on Wednesdays, I'm probably not going to volunteer. But when these communities came together, it actually, you know, the, the sum of the parts 
the sum was greater than the parts. And by bringing those two communities together, it increased the total base of volunteers, it increased the opportunities for those volunteers to engage in, and was able to have a stronger impact on the community than either one of those groups would have had alone. So I want to share a few examples of how colleges and universities around the country have responded to this fifth civic good in particular and how they've created opportunities to bridge social capital across religious lines of difference and to create um, meaningful impact in addressing social problems. So the first example I will give is from um, the University of North Florida. And the University of North Florida, their student interfaith group and their interfaith center decided to organize a couple years ago around the issue of human trafficking. And um, they did this for a very particular reason because they had just found out that Florida was ranked the number three state in the country with the most reported human trafficking cases in the United States. And this was being addressed on NPR. They were talking about human trafficking. It was in the news and everyone on campus was talking about it. But most students didn't actually know that much about the if issue of human trafficking and they didn't know what to do about it. So this felt like a major issue in their local community that students wanted to tackle and address. So they partnered with local community organizations that focused on this issue directly. They partnered with local religious organizations, synagogues, church, mosques, etc., who also cared about this issue and wanted to get involved. And what they also did was seek out a wide variety of partners on campus, which um, I'm consistently impressed by this, this group's ability to, to reach out to unlikely partners. So they partnered with um, the Honors Program, they partnered with Greek Life, the International Center, the Women's Center, Intercultural for Peace, uh, Intercultural Center for Peace, the Military Veterans Resource Center, and a whole host of other um, civic and religious-minded organizations to work together on this issue. Um, and they worked on it in a few different ways. So they did it first through awareness raising. So they did a huge campaign around campus to raise awareness of this issue. They did it through direct service, um, through donation drives for survivors, working with a local organization based on what, they, what their sense is, what the survivors needed. They did direct service um, with an organization that served survivors to help out that organization in cleaning up their warehouse. They showed a documentary film on campus um, to educate the campus about the issue and so on and so forth. So they really took a multifaceted approach, um, really like what Shelley was talking about before where they were thinking really systematically about the issue, how do we educate on this, how do we raise awareness, how do we, take, how do, we do service with a local partner in a way that's impactful and not just kind of feel good for us. Um, and they were able to raise awareness uh, among over 3,000 3, people on campus, participated somehow in this campaign, whether through their online campaign or coming to one of the events, um, and were able to make a real difference based on this. The second example I'll give um, is from High Point University, and this is a newer story. They just really started their interfaith group um, last year, and their, their group is called Interfaith United, and it was formed by staff and students together. And their campus doesn't have a lot of religious diversity, so they felt like in creating, a relig in creating um, an interfaith group, they really needed to collaborate with other groups on campus. So they built strong partnerships with the Black Cultural Awareness Club, with the Diversity Club, with the LGBTQ Support Group, with other religious life groups, and really um, set a standard for themselves as being a, a collaborator when it comes to diversity on campus. And they started engaging in social service and social, social projects with a lot of these other groups and making impact on their campus. Um, and then what happened, um, unfortunately, what at, during the time that they were starting this was the tragic killing of three Muslim students in Chapel Hill. And um, this was obviously a horrible situation and this campus is based in North Carolina, so it was very close to home for them. And what their group was able to do was twofold. One was that they provided a space for the campus to reflect and to mourn and to be in solidarity with each other after this horrible tragedy and to come together across lines of religious difference and across other lines of difference to be in solidarity with each other. And the second thing that they were able to do was actually mobilize the campus to do something. So you may have heard of the Feed the Legacy campaign, which was started in memory of these three students in order to honor their legacy and their commitment to social justice by um, working on hunger issues around the country. And so the interfaith group at High Point University was able to um, collect over 2,000 pounds of food to donate to the Feed the Legacy campaign. Um, by mobilizing people across lines of religious difference and by organizing in an interfaith way. 
The third example I'll share is one that's in progress. So I actually don't even quite know the outcome of this, but Grand Valley State University in Michigan um, has been dealing as many places in the country have been with um, an influx of refugees and trying to figure out how to, how to welcome in and how to deal with refugees. And they got inspired to um, take action around this first when their governor came out against bringing in refugees, which didn't actually have policy implications, so refugees conti continued to come in. And their interfaith center on campus, as well as their local community organizations, were trying to figure out what can we do about this, not in terms of a political perspective, bring in refugees, don't bring in refugees, but in terms of the actual human beings who are now our neighbors who are in our community, regardless of our political positions, how do we welcome them? How do we create space for them in our community? So actually, just last week on March 8th, they gathered over 50 different religious and civic organizations for a program called Refu Welcoming Refugees Do Unto Others. And their goal, um, as you can see up here, was to bring together churches and mosques and businesses and schools and the campus community, really the entire community together, um, to learn from and engage with their local refugee population, to learn about, to get to know some of the refugees, to learn about the issues facing this community and how they could come together as a community and support them. Um, and they really felt inspired in this by the golden, you know, kind of golden rule from all traditions, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, love your neighbor as yourself. It, there are lots of different iterations, but they really saw this as a shared value of supporting and loving your neighbors that they had, regardless of what religious tradition or non-religious tradition they were coming from. And they came together based on this value and um, hosted this initial event to kind of garner support around this. So I actually... Don't know where this is going, but I think there's a lot of potential here in terms of continuing to engage their local community and build stronger human relationships. Um, there are a few things I want to highlight from all of these stories that I think are, are incredibly powerful. One is that they all really found a way to engage meaningfully with a relevant and a local or, or national issue. So um, there's a lot of community service out there that feels more let me learn from this or let me feel good from this experience. And I think these are all examples of students and staff who really were able to pinpoint something that was relevant, that was meaningful, and where they could actually do something to have an impact. Um, the second piece of it is that they did interfaith reflection. And I didn't kind of pull this out through each story, but these weren't just people from different backgrounds coming together, but they've integrated intentional reflection into this. And I know this is something that University of North Florida especially does really well through their service projects, is they create opportunities for people to say, how do I view this issue as a Methodist? Or how do I view this issue as a Hindu? What from my tradition calls me to serve? And what from my tradition sheds wisdom on maybe how we could help solve this issue or make progress on this issue. So it's you know, very intentionally not just using the social capital from faith communities, but actually really intentionally embedding a learning experience into that. Um, and the third is that they um, all really engage different layers and different aspects of the university into their programming. So this is um, kind of IFYC's campus ecology diagram where we think about the different layers of the university because there are so many different constituents and communities within the university. And through all these programs, a lot of them were very student driven and student inspired, but they were able to find allies and supporters among staff and faculty. The president and the administration, um, in some cases, really needs to provide support for these things to happen. So they're not just a single layer constituency trying to make change, but really collaborating together across the types of people in the university setting that aren't always in conversation with each other um, in order to make change and have a positive civic impact. Thank you. Thank you.